morning. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship here on this third Sunday of Lent. We're glad that you're here uh, to worship with us today. As has become our recent tradition, let us um, begin by reciting our statement of purpose to find right after the word welcome back on the announcements page. We'll read it together. To welcome all people, share Christ's love for one another, and help make Christ visible in daily life. We um, hope that as we gather for this time of worship, that uh, we will exhibit God's love for all of God's people, and that we may be inspired to go out and serve in new and um, creative and exciting ways. Please pay attention to all the prayer concerns that are listed there in your bulletin. Um, pray for them not only today, but in the coming days and weeks. We continue to collect renter's receipts. You can um, read how to do those, and they, there's a bin for them, a box for them in the worship center over here to my, the welcome center over here to my right. We continue as a, uh, to collect food, uh, non-perishable foods. Um, please read that announcement, and if you're so moved, please bring food and place it in the, uh, the bin that's also in the welcome center. We're always looking for bulletin and flower sponsors. You can read about how to do that. Um, also, uh, make, please be aware of our prayer shawl ministry and its importance to those who are ill or grieving or in need of some comfort. Please read about those also in our bulletin. Um, <clears throat> Jerusalem Lester Salisbury Church is taking part along with a bunch of other churches, uh, most of them Lutheran, but um, also uh, church, the Church of the Mediator, Episcopal Church and uh, First Presbyterian Church of Allentown um, for a time of Lenten study and reflection and some food, sharing, learning, and fellowship. Um, each Wednesday from 12 noon to 1.15 at St. Timothy's, which is very easy to find on Hot Street. It's very easy access. You park in the back, come right into the Fellowship Hall. It's a very wonderful time of fellowship. We've been having a great turnout. We had 80 plus the first week, 64 last week. Wednesday in the pouring heavy rain, and um, so you're all um, invited to join. On March 13th, a Jerusalem Western Salisbury Church will be the one providing the soup and the salad. So if you'd like to do that kind of stuff, please talk to Linda Hellel after the service today, too. Um, it's a great coming together of all of these churches, and um, former Bishop Sam Zeiser, who's serving as interim pastor at Christ Lutheran, um, said that when we, when we also do some singing, right? We do all kinds of fun stuff there. Um, and uh, Sam said, because we gather together, even though we're members of all these different churches, we are doing the church on Wednesday. So come and do church with us. We're always done by the latest 1.30, and you can be on your way. But it's just a, a very good time um, to sit and think, get, think differently during Lent, which is what we're called to do. Choir rehearsed today. And we'll be rehearsing again next Sunday and singing next Sunday. And then we'll also be getting ready with dates for rehearsal for Easter Sunday when we'll also be singing. So if you are so inclined to sing, please talk to us and we'll hook you up. Please note that the annual congregational meeting to accept the 2023 annual report will be held on Sunday, March 17th at 9, after this service at 945. And uh, the fellowship committee is also planning refreshment time immediately after the meeting. So mark your calendars. Copies of the um, of the annual report will be available prior to the meeting date for you to review before you come to the meeting. Um, it would be great if you mark your calendars and could be here because we we're always make, we always want to make sure that we have a quorum so that we can have a meeting. Um, a quick update on yoga: there will be yoga next um, tomorrow. Um, um, and then, but then next Monday there won't be any. <laughs> but so make sure if you like you like to participate in that, come. And Emma says she's ready to lead it tomorrow, so she'll be here, and I hope you will be too. If that's something you like to do. The final announcement is um, Easter is coming quickly. The deadline for um, Easter lily plants is next Sunday, March the tenth, and you can see all of the rest of the information there. 
Let us now prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. In the name of the Creator God, and of the Redeeming Son, and of the Ever-Present Spirit. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who writes the law on our hearts, who draws all people together through Jesus. Amen. Held in God's mercy, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy God, we confess that we are caught in the snares of sin and cannot break free. We hoard resources while our behaviors are hungry and cold. We speak in ways that silence others. We are silent when we should speak up. We keep score in our hearts. We let hurts grow into hatred. For all these things, and for sins only known, forgive us, the Lord. Amen. Here is a flood of grace. Out of love for the whole world, God draws near to us breaks every snare of sin, washes away our wrongs, and restores the promise of life through Jesus Christ.
Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that only comes through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May we see you. Just before, as Ron comes up to read the scripture, um, one of the things that I meant to say at the begin, the end of the announcements, it's with sadness that I report to you the death of Esther Schiavone. She um, was a longtime member of this church, 94 years old. Um, the celebration of her life will be at a graveside service on Thursday here at our um, cemetery. Please especially um, remember her nieces and um, her nephew and some uh, and other family members um, in this time of loss and sadness. Thank you. The first lesson today is from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 20. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, well, well, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident of your town. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witness the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and shook at a distance, and said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you, so that you shall not sin. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Psalter today comes from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims its maker's handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night marks knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, their voices are not heard. Their sound is gone from all the walls, and their message to the ends of the world. For God has pitched a tent for the sun. It comes forth like a bright. 
above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound, and innocent of a great offense. Let the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. The epistle lesson this morning, the text for the message comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 18 through 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discerning of the dis a discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided, through the foolishness of our proclamation, to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are the call, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Did you get that? The message from the reading from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the church that he established at Corinth that I just read. Did you understand that what Paul is talking about? Listen again to the specific verses that I'm talking about. Since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation, our preaching, to save those who believe. So if that's, if you need it a little, even a little more clear, clearer, really clear, listen to the same verses, this time from the message translation. Since the world, in all its fancy wisdom, never had a clue when it came to knowing God, knowing God and God's wisdom, this same God took delight in using what the world considered dumb, preaching, of all things, God used preaching, proclaiming the word, telling the story, convincing them to believe in Jesus, to bring those who trust Jesus into a way of salvation, the way Jesus can and does save you and me. Thanks be to God. Shifting gears a little bit, have you ever noticed that many of us tend to separate, including myself in this, many of us tend to separate how we think and listen and hear at church with how we think and listen and hear in our everyday lives. It seems that we hear about the way Jesus did ministry at church and what Jesus calls us to do when we leave church and how we should do it, and then we don't always carry all that into our everyday lives. Some of us, it seems to me, think it's okay to separate Jesus and his call on our lives and his instructions on how to live our lives. We too often separate all that from how we think and listen in our everyday lives. Let's be clear, when I say everyday lives, I'm talking about everything from what we do, think, and say at work, what we do, think, and say in all the rest of the things that we do on a daily basis. Also, how we listen, or maybe even what we hear, or maybe even more specifically, what we want to hear. As we listen and become captive to the 24-hour news machines, not just the ones we don't like and don't agree with. Those aren't the only bad ones, but the whole 24-hour news cycle thing that comes at us from all directions, all political persuasions and all perspectives. It too often de defines our thinking. Instead of allowing our faith and belief and trust in Jesus and allowing us to do what Jesus is calling us to do and who Jesus is calling us to be, in following all that Jesus has taught us. Too often we think we need to lean on 
or be protected by the secular powers, to rely on the political and economic powers of the world to save us and protect us. Sometimes we think it's the only way for us, all of us, to be protected and saved instead of giving it all up to Jesus. Our church mind then becomes something we only seem to use, guess where? <laughs> at church. Yes, at church. What do I mean? Well, at least while we're in the comfort of these four walls, scripture, faith, interpretation of scripture, and all this God stuff, we tend to just accept the beliefs and values of the Christian faith so automatically and effortlessly, at least while we're at church or in church. I know it's true for me, sometimes, once inside these four walls, we tend to accept or believe or endorse and find ourselves believing things here inside the church that we wouldn't let anyone try and tell you or me in our, in your, in our so-called everyday mind, the so-called real world. One preacher put it this way, that which people would choke on in everyday speech, they will swallow if it's proclaimed in a sermon, expressed in the liturgy, or prayed in a prayer. This, uh, that's a blessing for those of us who get paid to preach Christ crucified, end quote. You see, our everyday man tries to convince us that all those Bible verses that sound good in principle, but seem so impractical when it comes to application, become a challenge to live out. You know the ones I'm talking about, like, thou shalt not kill and love your enemies. Those have come to the front of our minds for some reason. Scripture tells us we're supposed to love our enemies, right? When there are murderers and rapists and both domestic and international terrorists out there just waiting to do it, just waiting to do it again, and just waiting to do it to us. There's so many other tough ones. How about blessed are the meek? It's one of my favorites. How can we be meek in a world that so often seems to only reward toughness and aggressiveness and assertiveness and brashness and crassness? Meekness may be fine for church on Sunday, but the real world, the meek, get to go home early. Another hard one to fully realize today, we know scripture says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. But where are and who are these peacemakers? It seems too many of us on, at all levels of society throughout the world are really just peace contemplators. The challenge becomes that we are not called to be peace contemplators, but instead Jesus calls us to be peacemakers. That is what the scripture says. It's part of the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, and the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus himself said it directly to his disciples. So I think it's time that we get busy making peace. And those words, they're not just words someone else is saying or what they reported was said. Jesus said them. And they're meant to include all of us who claim to be Jesus' disciples today. By the world standards of what works and who is the greatest and who is practical to some, the Christian faith can sometimes begin to look foolish indeed. But then we remember that little part from Scripture that I read earlier. Since the world, in all its fancy wisdom, has a, had a clue when it came to knowing God, knowing God and God's wisdom. That same God took delight in using what the world considers dumb, preaching of all things. God used preaching, proclaiming the world, word, telling the story, convincing them to believe in Jesus, to bring those who trust Jesus into the way of salvation, the way Jesus can and does save you and me. In this third week of Lent, we continue traveling with Jesus in a journey that we know ends at the cross. So we need to stop for a moment to catch our breath and ponder the irony of all that. As the world laughs at the church sometimes, and sometimes even mocks the church, we pause with Paul because we know that God used preaching, proclaiming the word, telling the story, convincing them and convincing us today to believe in Jesus, to bring those who trust Jesus into the way of salvation, the way Jesus can and does save you and me. In just a few more weeks, we come to Palm Sunday, 
the Palm Sunday Parade, the parade that so often is portrayed as the arrival of the Savior, the arrival of the King, at least that's what the people gathered to watch thought was happening. That is why they spread the palm branches and their cloaks on the road and call out Hosanna. But instead, Jesus arrived on the back of a small donkey, not a great warrior, riding in with a powerful horse hitched to a golden chariot that they expected. Because you see, friends, Jesus was not coming to Jerusalem to go to the King David Hotel for a meeting with Israeli and Palestinian political leaders. Jesus was not coming to negotiate a political solution. Jesus was not coming to Jerusalem to hobnob with the rich and powerful. Jesus does not care about our political differences. Jesus does not favor one way or one political ideology or one side over the other. Instead, if you stop and think about it, to so many people, this is the Messiah, the one they thought has come to save them, but also the one who doesn't always make sense. This Messiah isn't the logical choice. The word itself, Messiah, the word Messiah means one who saves as it rescues us. And according to almost every message we receive in the world today, we're told and we're taught and we're bombarded with the notion that the only way to save the world, the only way to save the church, the only way to save ourselves is with power and might and money and more economic and political power. And that power is influence. All of those may seem to be logical choices. But Jesus calls us to proclaim the word, telling the story, convincing them to believe in Jesus, to bring all those who trust into the way of salvation, the way Jesus can and does save you and me. Too often it seems to be, or maybe it's all about appearances, you know. It all depends on how you look at it. That seems to be the easy way out. It seems that when Paul wrote his letter to the church in Corinth in today's gospel passage, the Apostle Paul was obviously addressing a group of people that he knew. Because Paul knows these people, Paul seems to be writing to these Corinthians with a bluntness that seems to spare no one's feelings. Paul exhorts, Paul calls out, Paul preaches with strong emphasis for those church people, those early Christians. He tells them to humble themselves because humility is an honest an objective reflection of our real relationship to and with God. The fact is that we are, all of us, we are dependent on God, or we should be dependent on God. You see, all that we have comes from God and all belongs to God. Our lives, our salvation, our hope, our Jesus. God has given us all we need. My challenge my challenge to all of you today, and to myself too, is to work toward merging our church mind with our everyday mind, so that our church mind becomes our watchdog, the mind that is with us 24-7, 365, the mind that makes us squirm, really squirm when we see things or hear things going on in the world around us that sound contrary to what we know the gospel of Jesus Christ calls us to do and be. The standard that is presented as the standard we need to strive toward, not turn our backs on, not look the other way, but strive toward. And just in case any of you are troubled by what I've said this morning, I leave you with this thought. Paul says here in Corinthians that the word about the cross, about preaching the cross, is valid because it is the source of our salvation. Are they just words? For some, perhaps. But listen to a portion of those words again, this time from 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 to 21. Listen with new ears. The message that points to Christ on the cross seems like sheer silliness to those hell-bent on destruction. But for those on the way of salvation, it makes perfect sense. This is the way God works, and most powerfully, as it turns out, it's written, I'll turn conventional wisdom on its head. I'll expose so-called experts as crackpots. So where can you find someone truly wise, truly educated, truly intelligent in this day and age? Hasn't God exposed it all as pretentious nonsense? 
since the world, in all its fancy wisdom, never had a clue when it came to knowing God. God, in God's wisdom, took delight in using what the world considered dumb preaching, of all things, to bring those who trust God into a way of salvation. So, siblings in Christ, fellow Lenten journeyers, may we trust God, may we seek the salvation that is ours, yours and mine, in Christ Jesus. May we continue on this journey again so that we might always remember that we are indeed a group of people radically changed because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. His life, his death, and his resurrection for you and for me. Oh, and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. In your mercy, loving God, hear our prayer. Amen.
Pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and a world in need. You alone are God. We thank you for the gift of Sabbath rest. Awaken the church to the mystery of your presence, and give us glad hearts as we receive the good news of your deliverance. Hear us, O oh God. As I said in the sermon, everything that we have belongs to God. And so, as we bring our tithes and offerings, we remember and give thanks for all that we have. Let us at this time bring forth our tithes and our offerings. setting up the, 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 um, the indoor yard sale and all who participated in it. We give thanks to God for um, that devotion to the church and the way that we work together to carry out just a small part of some of the things that help support God's ministry. So we give thanks for everyone who took part in that yesterday. And now let us pray together. We bring our offerings of God, not to God in favor, but to express our gratitude. Not to support an institution, but to further your mission. We support the church in its efforts to challenge the false wisdom that pervades our culture. We seek to make this community of faith a center of values that are consistent with your will. May we be zealous in your service, willing to sacrifice for love's sake, and eager to embrace your word in our everyday life. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God most high. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so, 
with all the choirs of angels and the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. blood of Christ, the cup of salvation, poured out for the remission of all of your sins, drink you all of it. Receive this blessing, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us now give thanks together. Bountiful God, we give you thanks that you have 
have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Christ, strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.